the people who have a clear understanding of, of the energy industry, which are you know the vast majority of you in this room today, um, and understand it from a scientific standpoint, understand it from uh, an experience standpoint, not just from some assumptions that somebody may have pulled out of the air or some worse than that paranoia uh, that gets uh, bandied around. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that everyone's uh, op opinion on energy uh, that's different from mine uh, is off base, but I think it is important to know our position and uh, it, the, and the counter arguments, I might add, it's, it's good to, to understand those um, that they're going to offer up uh, because America's future is at stake as we go through and have this energy uh, discussion, this energy debate. I believe anybody discussing energy in our nation and in the world for that matter must begin with acknowledging the essential role that oil and gas has played throughout our history and the reality that they must continue uh, as fundamental elements of our energy portfolio. Uh, the IOGCC is obligated to be that leading voice in that conversation. The fact of the matter is, Rob, nobody else can match our expertise. I mean, that's, the, that's a fact. Um, and our nation cannot afford to make a decision based entirely on the viewpoints of a radical green energy crowd. Um, by and large, our arguments are based on science and experience, while I suspect theirs largely is from talking points crafted by folks who stand to gain from restrictions on traditional energy production, and I might add an avalanche of federal funds. Uh, and don't get me wrong. I am a fan of renewable energy sources. They, they are an essential part uh, of our nation's energy strategy because I'm kind of an all of the above guy. I mean, we're going to have to have all of these, Scott. You and I have talked about this, and I think in your uh, presentation you laid it out rather well. Uh, as we work towards energy independence, we are going to have to have an all of the above approach. In Texas, we're, we worked really hard. Elizabeth, you've been engaged in this and, and the expansion of our portfolio. Uh, but we've done it with incentives rather than the heavy hand of government mandate. As a result, we've installed more wind capacity than any other state in the nation. Matter of fact, all but four countries in the world, uh, we have more wind energy. But we understand that oil and gas is that tried and true resource that is in place. It's providing the, the vital energy and I might add it's employing thousands of Americans. Unfortunately, too many folks with a voice in the conversation base their perception on this business that we're involved in on newsreels of gushing oil wells, of, of wildcatters firing off a big long cigar with a hundred dollar bill and um, you know, generally they always have a cowboy hat on when they're doing that, Brad. I, I don't know who they're pointing to. I, I got an idea. It's all of us from the that central part of the South. Um, our job is to keep changing that perception. I, I think it's very important for us to, to stand up with facts and reality and experience and say that's not what this industry is all about. And we do it by sharing facts. We need to be sharing the facts about constantly improving technologies that have made this energy industry cleaner and more efficient and more cost effective. We need to be sharing the facts about the real cost of energy sources and who's actually paying for them. The facts are still our main defense against an administration in Washington that has essentially declared traditional energy sources, oil, gas, and coal, public enemy number one. Left unchecked, this administration is on a course to destroy this industry. And I, I think they'll use any means necessary. 
On the financial side, the President's 2010 budget slashes longstanding incentives for the oil and gas business, a move that the American Petroleum Institute estimates will cost $80 billion in the next 10 years, while also cutting into production, jobs, and revenues. On the legislative side, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Waxman-Markey cap-and-trade bill by a fairly narrow margin of 219 to 212. And from what we're hearing, the Senate version is even worse. As it stands, this bill would usher in the single largest tax in the history of our country. Along with an unprecedented degree of federal intrusion into every farm, every neighborhood, and every workplace in this country. These energy taxes will cause every product that uses energy in its creation, cultivation, transportation to become more expensive, forcing hardworking Americans to bear the massive new cost of this and kicking the legs out from under a national economy that is already wobbly at best. These taxes will also hammer the states that produce and refine vital energy sources. And I might add that our families and our citizens are employed by. Shackling our economy with a crushing burden of new regulation will also place our entire country at an unfair advantage to countries like China, India, who know better than to forego their economic growth and prosperity in return for no measurable benefit. Do you think our country's latest unemployment figures are bad? If you drive the energy prices upward with this misguided legislation, we've only seen the tip of that iceberg. I know I know with all of my heart that that is bad public policy, and it is bad for America, and it's bad for the future of this world, I think. The other day, our energy experts in Texas presented their analysis of the Waxman-Markey bill, and they offered up some numbers that should disturb everyone in this audience and everyone who is listening to this. According to our comptroller, this legislation would immediately increase the annual cost of household goods for Texas citizens by about $1,200. Annual electricity costs would go up, and this is the President's words, they would necessarily skyrocket by about $650 per year per household in 2013. You know, pick your multiple of those numbers when it comes time to talk about the cost of impact on manufacturers. You think that's going to create jobs? No, it's not going to create jobs. If Waxman market goes through, we estimate that somewhere between 200 and 300,000 Texans will lose their job. I suspect your states could reference similar impact percentage-wise. Advocates of this so-called green economy say, don't worry, our green economy will create millions of jobs. When they tell you this fairy tale, they're always kind of forget to get to that happily ever after part in the fairy tale. They don't tell you what Spain learned, who pushed for those green jobs as well. According to the recent study by King Juan Carlos University, Spain lost 2.2 real jobs for every green job that they created. And they found each job cost roughly $774,000 to create. Now, Tracy, um, I'm thinking that you might be able to create some jobs for less than $774,000 per job. Am I, am I thinking right? That's what I thought. I suspect that supporters of Waxman Markey are aware of these numbers. How else do you explain funds in the bill that they wrote themselves to pay displaced workers, underwrite their health care, 
provide for job training for up to three years. Knowing somebody is going to buy you a cup of coffee after they burn down your house <laughs> is not particularly um, heartwarming or satisfying. Henry Waxman and Edward Markey aren't the only federal lawmakers drawing a beat on the oil and gas industry. Scott, they've got some legislation up there that has the hydraulic fracking right in the middle of the radar screen. That's yet another example of how misinformation about this industry and its proven technologies is used to sway opinion. I've heard the prospects for passing House Bill 2766 and Senate Bill 1215 aren't real strong this year. <laughs> I think there's a reason that Harry Reid said, I don't want y'all to go home in October. Stay up here. <laughs> they went home in August and got an earful. Good. 